This video introduces the Kruskal-Wallis test, which is the non-parametric equivalent of ANOVA, so it tests for differences in central tendency among more than two non-normally distributed samples. So as I said, the, t the purpose of the Kruskal-Wallis test is to examine differences in central tendency. It works on rank order data, so it doesn't specifically test for the mean or the median, but the null hypothesis is that all samples are taken from populations with the same location. So location in this sense just means the center of the distribution. So the test requires that your data be continuous variables in predetermined groups or samples. Because it is a rank order method, you can also use ranked data. This was the case we saw in the Mammut EU test in the previous video. The test is a univariate one, so you must be comparing only a single variable among the samples. But it is designed to handle more than two samples. And as mentioned before, it compares central tendency among the samples. And because it is non-parametric, there is no requirement that the data be normally distributed. So what does the test do? Like the Man whitney u test and, and other non-parametric methods, it pools the samples together and converts the values to ranks. And it then just performs an ANOVA on the ranks. So the, the signal, essentially, is the difference between each sample's mean rank and the overall mean rank weighted for sample size. The, uh, the noise is the spread of ranks within each sample. So remember from the Man whitney u test video that ranks are just the order of the data. So the smallest value will be 1, the second smallest will be 2, and so forth. So with these formulas here, if you compare them to ANOVA for the between groups and within groups mean square, you can see the similarities. And we're just performing ANOVA here, but instead of the data, we're using the ranks. And so like ANOVA, the test statistic, which is called H here, is the ratio of those two um, values. The signal was such as the between ranks mean square, you could call it, and the within ranks mean square. <clears throat> but to calculate the p-value, we need to know the probability of observing an H statistic at least as extreme as we did if the null hypothesis is true. So we need to know what is the expected distribution of H statistics for a given sample size in the case of H0 being true. So unless you have quite small sample sizes, you know, small being like five or less, which is very small, uh, the expected values for the H statistic, if the null hypothesis is true, come from a statistical distribution called the chi-squared distribution. So the degrees of freedom for this distribution are the number of samples minus one, which I've written as m minus one. So the p-value is therefore the area under the chi-squared probability density function curve for values at least as extreme as the observed H statistic. So although the Kruskal-Wallis test is non-parametric, it does have some other assumptions. As in virtually all tests, the samples must be independent of one another, and this is mostly the case in, in pretty much all sorts of data you'd experience as an, as an Earth scientist. Uh, the distribution should have the same general shape, like not skewed in opposite directions, for example, and they should have equal variances. But in practice, as long as the variances don't differ by too much, say, you know, like the smallest one, or the biggest one isn't more than like four times the smallest one or whatever, um, you, you should be okay. But let's say you get a significant result from a Kruskal-Wallis test. That means that at least one of the samples comes from a population with a significantly different location but which one or, or ones? There's no specific post hoc test. Not, there's no thing like the Tukey test for the ANOVA, but you can perform multiple pairwise man whitney u tests, but making sure that you have to correct the significance level for doing multiple comparisons. Remember that multiple comparisons will increase the chance that at least one of them is a type one error. So one recommended method for correcting this is called the Holm correction. And it's easy to, easiest to demonstrate how it works with, with a, an example. So let's say we ran five tests, and we got these p-values, which are in ascending order from smallest on the left to largest on the right. Instead of comparing them all to 0.05, the traditional significance level alpha, we have an adjusted alpha. So the first one, which we compare to the smallest p-value, is just 0.05 divided by 5, and we have 0.05 divided by 4, 
0.05 divided by 3, 0.05 divided by 2, and finally 0.05 divided by 1, which is 0.05. So we compare the first p-value, we do this sequentially, and we compare the first one to the adjusted threshold, and we can say, yes, this is statistically significant because the p-value is less than 0.01. The second one is also statistically significant, and the third one is also statistically significant, but the fourth one is not because the p-value is greater than our adjusted significance level. And so at that point we stop. We don't even look at the fifth one, um, even if subsequent values might be below the adjusted threshold. So here's what you should report when you are describing the results of a Kruskal-Wallis test. You should list the medians, or give them in a, in a table if there's lot, even though the method doesn't test for differences in median, it is the best measure of central tendency for non-normal data. As always, you should report the test name, the test statistic H in this case, the degrees of freedom, and the p-value. And so make sure to use the correct phrasing about significantly different versus not significantly different. An example of how you might report a Kruskal-Wallis result is given at the bottom here. So our syntax for the Kruskal-Wallis test is basically the same as ANOVA. The function is called Kruskal.test, and you enter the column name that contains your numeric data and your column name that contains the categorical grouping factors as a formula with the little tilde symbol, meaning like as a function of. So we want to know, do the numeric data vary as a function of the category that they're in? And just the column names are required here. You don't need the dollar sign or anything like that because you can specify the data frame name with the data equals part of the, of the function call. So the output will give you the H statistic, which is called the Kruskal-Wallis chi-squared here. It gives you the degrees of freedom, and it gives you the p-value. So the pairwise Mann-Whitney u-test function is a bit different in its format. You'll need to specify the data frame and the columns using the, the dollar symbol style, which you've used before, and you separate the numeric data and the categorical grouping factors with a comma, not writing them as a formula with the tilde. So the output will be a matrix of adjusted p-values. So rather than adjusting the significance level like I demonstrated before, the p-value in R here is just adjusted so you can compare each one to the traditional 0 0.05. So each entry in the matrix, the triangular matrix of numbers here, gives the p-value for the comparison between the sample listed in the row label and the sample listed in the column label. It specifies the p-value adjustment method at the bottom, which in this case is the home method I described before. Um, you can choose different ones, but the home one is, is often sort of a preferred one, and so you should just stick with that, which is the default version.